Just shared last update in Facebook to announce that we are live. Yeah. So, okay, guys, we are live now. We are live on YouTube and uh, welcome everybody. Welcome uh, everybody here, all the elite panelists and uh, uh, the main speaker as well. If I, I'm not going to take his name uh, before I introduce him. And so uh, this is another episode of Extra Bites. And we came up with this idea of um, helping the supporting the photography community, which is going through some uh, phases which is which is difficult for uh, survival also for some uh, because of this covid-19 lockdown and we thought that the best way to stay motivated is to listen to the masters uh, in landscape photography and today we have none other than um, uh, mad peter everson and before i really go to him let me first introduce the uh, panelists we have prakash from dubai we have som uh, from uh, Bangalore, India. We have Anu uh, from from Canada, and uh, we have Sandeep from Delhi. We have Sarita from Delhi, and I am also from Delhi and CR. Okay, now uh, honestly, um, first let me welcome you, uh, Mads, and um, thank you so much for really accepting our invite to join um, here on Exploring Light. and taking out your valuable time to speak to all of us and all the viewers and your followers um on youtube honestly if i if i really talk about uh, the current moment it is it is almost a fanboy moment for me and uh, uh, ever since i thought of uh, taking a landscape photography and if if there was one person whose work i always wanted to refer and go back to was you mads and um, i have no hesitation in saying that and that continued for quite some time and uh, uh, again your name cropped up uh, when when i was hope, planning to start my youtube channel this exploring light so i had announced it and uh, then i uh, went through this nervous breakdown of how to manage it will i be able to do it or not and i was going through lot of uh, youtube channels and uh, my initial idea was to start the way you do you go to the locations and and create uh, stunning videos there and i again your video channel came to the forefront came to rescue and every time i would go to your channel and uh, and uh, watch uh, for for seeking inspiration so it certainly is a fanboy moment for me and if i whenever i look at your images and and that's what i want to tell everyone who's watching on youtube as well um they are beyond this world uh, and and if i have to describe them in any uh, one word um i think first of all they are by far the best that i can i can think of and uh, the speciality is the uniqueness is the way you use light and how you how you express yourself through the light that you see there and and um it almost looks like as if you have a direct connection with the light god and you communicate with him and you somehow ensure that the light falls on the right spot where you wanted it to be and in the right <laughs> balance and you will be so disappointed <laughs> i have no hesitation in saying that um in calling you in my opinion you are the lord of landscapes and so without much to do without really trying to blabber and trying to hog unnecessary limelight 
over to you, Mads. We want to hear from you, your journey into photography. Um, I have read quite a lot um, research on you. Uh, so I, we would like to hear from you, uh, your initial days, your challenges, your inspirations, how you overcome, uh, why not Denmark, why Iceland? And, um, and so, so all those, your journey, um, over to you, Mads. Thank you so much, Yasi. It's uh, way too nice words. Like, obviously, I'm standing on the shoulder of giants too. So I have learned so much from a lot of the panelists you have already had. Uh, some of the earlier days, uh, like Ryan Dyer, and I think it's on Wednesday, maybe, you have uh, Ted Gore also. Uh, yeah, two yeah. of my super favorite photographers. They, they are so amazing. So I owe a lot to them and their work. Uh, definitely so so yeah well where where to even begin i made this little uh, powerpoint here let's see if i can figure out how to share that so let's go there all right so you see my screen now yeah we can yeah great so i wanted to start like you know before my actual photography start photography career started because I do believe that many of us, especially in the beginning, and I still consider myself to be in the beginning, we are taking a lot of, well, a lot of who we are, our identity, and put it into our photography. And if you look at my photography, I think it's quite obvious from where I come, what's happening in my head. So... Uh, Let's see here if I can make this work here. All right. So back in like the start of the millennia, uh, or all the way up to now, actually, I've had a huge interest for, as you can see, trailer music, uh, production music. But generally, it's like this overarching uh, interest for, for fantasy uh, and movies, video games, books, and so forth. Um, and, and my entrance to everything epic was through trailer music. Uh, I, I would say I was part of a community where we find out how to share music uh, back when it was still illegal, but nevertheless, it was the only way to obtain it because it wasn't for sale. Um, and in that community, we started to make like fan trailers for blockbuster movies and, and so forth. And that was kind of where I learned my first initial steps into video uh, editing and video production. And throughout the years, I, yeah, of course, watched fantasy movies like Lord of the Rings. I played a whole lot of World of Warcraft, the big, massive multiplayer online role playing game. Um, and was just in, took a lot in from pop culture. Uh, I was born in 1986, so I'm what you would probably call a typical millennia. And uh, yeah, so obviously I've just got a lot from pop culture and that's more or less who I am. Um, I went over a little bit more, also listened to rock music, metal music, but the more symphonic parts of it. And I've had a big interest for science and philosophy and history and all those things. You can't really see that much, see much of that in my photography, but it's definitely there. And through my career as a gymnast, it wasn't really a career. It was just like, you know, for fun sports. Uh, I used video editing, uh, honing my skills, uh, filming myself and filming my team members and so forth uh, in slow motion and yeah, practiced even more videography and then when we come to 2011 2012 uh, I really started to uh, to understand photography because I borrowed my dad's first camera the Canon 550D it could film slow motion 60 frames per second at 700p which were just mind-boggling back then that you could have such a cheap camera and uh, and have that kind of feature so when I borrowed that for whatever video I did, I obviously also started exploring the photography parts and I went into like trying to understand what can a raw file do? And as you can see here, these are some of my very, very early photos, just taking 
photos out of the door during a lightning storm or taking photos of the flowers in the garden. And I didn't use Lightroom back then or Camera Raw. I used uh, Canon's own little raw converter. And when I found out how that worked, I was just sold. It was like such an epiphany. I was like, oh, this is how the professional photographers do. And then I just started seeking out information. Uh, already back then, there was some tutorial videos on YouTube. And that is mainly where I've learned most of what I can do. But as you can see, like my photography was like particularly interesting back then. It was more a question about learning different techniques. So some light painting, masking, and a little bit of long exposure and playing with colors. So you can see here again, it's just toned differently. And I took pictures of everything, the Milky Way and the sun and my booze. I had my HDR period, as you can see here, uh, absolutely terrible. But I think many of us who started out photography in 2012, we were, we were very much into this HDR because it was just so different from everything else you have seen. And you do have to have like a minimum understanding of photography techniques to get there. Like it, it, no, it was not everybody who could just do HDR. So already there was, was something special. You were more than the mob with their photos that weren't edited. And uh, yeah, I just continued with HDR and played around with like a lot of different um, ways of expressing myself, some black and white. Instead Didn't hold long, but it was there started being attracted to the golden hour to pictures of my friends i did a lot of portrait photography did long exposure at night really just everything back then i didn't even share it to instagram because it wasn't a thing back then i just uploaded it to a private folder on on facebook shared it with my friends and in that period I, it just went yeah with with all sorts of different things took pictures from my travels, more HDR and so forth, band photography. I, I literally tried everything. And then I had a period of, of light painting. And yeah, as you can see, steel wool photography. I was very fascinated by light painting because you could control light uh, that much and make all these super, yeah, out of this world uh, effects. And let's be honest, it's just a fact. Like it, it, there's not much of an aesthetic value to it. It just looks nice. You look at it and it's like, whoa, how do you do that? Uh, and yeah, so I played around with a lot of different uh, kinds of lights. Um, yeah, steel wool and flashlights. And I bought all sorts of weird light components from eBay uh, with different colors. A lot of it was actually just children's toys but it had a lot of different colors and, and weird lights to it. So I just played around with it. And I barely, by playing around with it, I got an understanding of how the camera works, how much uh, the sensor absorbs. And do you have to, when you do a long exposure, do you have to close down the aperture? Do you have to pump up the ISO? All those things, like I got a pretty good idea about how the, the technical aspects of photography works. And here's a, just a long exposure from Tivoli Gardens uh, in Copenhagen. I have some boats with some LED lights on that lake here in front of us that's just floating around. And you have absolutely no clue what it is you're looking at, but again, it, it, it looks nice. <laughs> and, th and that was mainly how I just started, like pointed my camera towards whatever I thought was interesting. And then I was just like, okay, cool. And then I kind of started to combining it uh, over time, some steel wool photography with some architecture photography. And I think it was, I think it was Ryan Dyer who mentioned that when, when you're playing around with this and wanting to learn landscape photography and you live in a city, just do some architecture photography or, or do some cityscape photography because it, it is more or less uh, the same techniques you need to use to, uh, to get there. Again, more light painting, uh, playing around with fire uh, and fire poise and all those things. 
did a lot of portraits, my first self-portrait, just like all the old painters painted themselves. Had some friends I could use for portrait photography. Uh, myself and my siblings. It was actually, this is where I start really to think about, like you have to think about the technique to do a photo like this, because this is one shot. So because my sister is as close to the camera as she is, obviously if I focused on her, me and my brother behind her would be out of focus. So I had to put the point of focus just behind her. So like, you know, a third into the scene and then just pump up the uh, the aperture to get everything in focus. But this is, uh, this is one exposure, no composites, anything like that. I just again, like, you know, played around with light, played, uh, played around with different flashes and light techniques and just got the silhouette of one of my friends. Again, just classic portrait photography. This one here inspired by the matrix. Um, yeah. And then I did a lot of like composite work. I was very inspired by an American portrait sports commercial photographer called Joel, Joel Grimes. And he was out taking a lot of, yeah, it's mainly cityscape, but also landscape photographs. And then he took a picture of a model within a studio and then he put them together. And it was through uh, studying his techniques that I learned uh, the most about editing uh, photos, I, I would say, and understanding light. So, you know, if you have a, a picture with the sun behind uh, a person, then you need to have the light direction from there. Like you, you can't have shadows going the other way than from where the light is coming. And it, it's basically just about like, you know, respecting light where it comes from. And uh, yeah, it just continued uh, honing my skills, some of it better than others. Uh, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's definitely something I, I look back on that, yeah, I've learned a lot from. And here again, you can see the fantasy elements uh, coming into my photographs. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's kind of easier to make these kinds of uh, composites because you don't have to match um, the, the shadows you can see of, of this girl down on the road. Obviously the road, she, she wasn't standing on that road. So you have to understand also shadows and all those things. And that can be a little bit harder. And yeah, just a, a lot of headshots of uh, all my friends. And yeah, some gymnastic photos. I did a lot of gymnastic photos. I was just sitting like an entire day photographing all the participants in different competitions and yeah. So yeah, I just uh, kept photographing everything I came by. And over the time, I, I started to hone myself into like, okay, I kind of like landscapes. Um, but I also like this editing element, I really enjoyed putting stuff together, and just using my imagination. So this is a picture out of my old dorm room. And then I just found some NASA, NASA picture of Saturn put it together, tried to match the light. So it kind of made sense what it is you were looking at. So it, there's some kind of realism to it, even though it's obviously not realistic at all. And yeah, I was also just like sometimes, you know, making not so great photos because there's really nothing here. It's just a lot of colors. And uh, yeah, I just continued like that playing around with depth of field and again, long exposure, black and white. This is where I found the clarity slider and I just pumped it up and got all this rain out, obviously <laughs> a little bit over the top, uh, a little bit better this one here. So yeah, it just continued like this with landscapes, uh, some moody, some more colorful and yeah. At some point I ended up in Iceland I just go through all these and especially Iceland, as you can see here, my first trip to Iceland, not all the photos I got from there was particularly good, but you can't really expect that when it's hard light and or harsh light. So some of it wasn't so good and then others were kind of nice. And 
you can see here, these are both photos from the first day I had in Iceland. And obviously I've edited those a bit more. You will see when we come to the editing part that for the most part, I edit quite a lot with my photos uh, to get them to where I want them to be. But uh, yeah, it was, an, it was a nice trip. And that was really what uh, confirmed to me that landscape photography is what I want to do. Uh, and and with these edits, I had also reached a point where I was like, okay, this is this is actually pretty decent, and and I could share them on more like you know public forums and and not being ridiculed, uh, which were you know always nice. <laughs> so yeah, uh, as you can see here, it's, it's just like different edits of of the same photos. And that is also something I often do. Like I go back to old photos and, and re-edit them and then something else comes out of it. It's not really any rules to how I do besides like for the most part, respecting light. Uh, always make sure that my light source is the brightest part of the photo for the most part. And yeah, as you can see here, this is also where I did composites. For me, it was just natural to do composites because I'd done all the work that I was inspired by, by Joel Grimes. So if I could combine them, which why not? Uh, that's obviously a, a big discussion these days, whether or not to, to composite landscape photography. Uh, I see myself in a, as an artist and you can do with your pictures what you want to do, but obviously don't lie about it if you are, if you are asked about it. So yeah. Uh, I just moved on, uh, tried to not shoot everything at 30 seconds, uh, especially waterfalls, tried with shorter long exposures to get a little bit more uh, texture in the water. Again, combining photos. Um, but yeah, just going to all the places I didn't, I, or I wasn't satisfied with uh, on my first trip to Iceland. This is my second trip. And it just continued like this. And then I really like, at, at this point, I didn't really earn anything from photography at all. And it was only just before I went to the US in 2016 that I started my, my YouTube channel. Uh, and up until then, I had shared my photos on 500 pixels and Facebook and started also to do that on Instagram. But, but back then, I also shared a lot of my portrait work. Um, so it wasn't before later that I deleted everything portraits from my Instagram and, and really decided, okay, landscape photography is what I want to do. And yeah, I just uh, went around the US for 40 days. Everything was about landscape photography. And it was just about getting to as many icons as possible. So you can see Mesa Arch and... Mesquite sand dunes from Death Valley, Yosemite Valley, and the the redwood forests, and of course the desert uh, areas. When I came home from the U.S., uh, one of the things I really wanted to do was move a little bit on with my work uh, of composite landscape photography, especially Milky Way composite photography. So a lot of my desert photos I made into Milky Way composites. We only really had two nights in the US where we had like a really strong Milky Way. And I only really have one really great Milky Way photo from there that I used to for most of my composite uh, photos. But you know, the Milky Way is the Milky Way. It, it is basically the same where <laughs> whenever you take a photo of it. And then I went to the Pharaohs also. And all the way through all this, like, you know, I developed my style and especially in the Pharaohs, it was a lot of moody photos because we had a lot of moody weather, but for the most part, we had some sun coming through and some light coming through that I could use. Throughout the trips, I, I always make sure to keep my eyes on, on different weather forecasts, cloud forecasts, especially to see where the light uh, comes from. Especially in the Faroe Islands, it's super important to be aware of where the wind comes from. 
uh, because clouds can form around these big mountains. So if you are standing at the wrong place with, with the wind, you can just be standing in a cloud for the entire day and don't see anything. So you need to be aware of that. And yeah, my first tour to, to the Faroe Islands was just very moody and it kind of like cemented my style of photography. And it was the same with the rest of 2017, where I just went to England and Europe and Norway. And yeah, just continued. 2018 and 2019, that was where I started to do workshops. So a lot of the photos that I have from those years are from the workshops and the tours I've done. I didn't do many tours on my own uh, those years. 2017 was definitely the year where I did most tours for myself. Um, but yeah, 2019, I also had a bit more time to explore uh, Denmark. And I really, when, when you have photographed Iceland and the Faroe Islands quite consistently for two years in a row, and you kind of get to the same locations all the time, you definitely want to explore a, a bit more uh, and, and see if you can get photos that are beyond the the icons so it's definitely something i i have tried to uh, when i've done photographs that at least try to make something which is partly original it's not always it happens um, but you know with a little bit of exploration you you can actually find some quite unique situations and when you combine that with everything you have learned about composition and weather forecast and so forth, even in Denmark, which I for many years considered to be a semi-boring country to photograph, it, it does become quite exciting when you can get some photos that you consider like on par with the photos that you can get in classic landscapes uh, like Iceland and the Faroe Islands or Western US. So yeah, just continue, continue, continue. And th that is uh, more or less my journey up until today. So Yasi, I don't know, do you have any questions uh, for now? Because I just keep talking and I'm, my voice is being weird. <laughs> you are, you're on mute. Jesse, you are on mute, Jesse. Yeah. So um, it's, a, it's a wonderful journey and I think uh, uh, I, in particular, and I, I am sure many of us uh, relate to it, and uh, that is, but very few uh, people who become successful uh, actually show the courage to share their old images, and it's, it, 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 it tells a lot about you as an individual that you have uh, uh, actually decided to share that on a public platform like YouTube, and I think uh, that's uh, so nice of you. Now, uh, my question is that uh, we, you started showing a lot of this um, transitional growth that, was, that you were going through right from HDR, uh, first initial mundane snaps and then going to HDR and a and lot of uh, zoom burst and, and moving the camera, moving the lens and doing HDR and composites and all those things. When do you, when, now when you look back, which year and which uh, particular tour you can attribute to you starting as a seriously starting as a landscape photographer? Um, <laughs> uh, I would say just before I went on my first Iceland tour in 2015, I, I had a pretty decent idea about my editing, which were not HDR. I had a few photos from Denmark that I appreciated. Don't know if you remember. There's like one with the boats during night, and there's a, a mill with the moon in the background. Those two photos are still considered to be. That was about where I went away from the HDR, and I had an editing style which I kind of like. Okay, this is this is fairly good. So I would say 2015 uh, is where I'm like, okay, I can do this. And then after my first Iceland trip, that was where it like cemented. Okay, and that was also in 2015 that this is what I want to do but I couldn't like live from it for a very long period. It wasn't like before 2018 when I actually started doing workshops that I started to have an actual income from photography. I sold a few prints here and there, 
but uh, not even YouTube gave like any kind of ad revenue. It's not before last year that ad revenue was of interest uh, to my budget throughout the year. Okay, that's interesting. Can you can you uh, just uh, change the slide to some image, maybe previous image, because <laughs> white slide might not. Yeah, something, something. Let it be. Yeah, there. here we go. I'll be talk. <laughs> okay. So uh, now another. Th this is very interesting, and this is very inspiring for everyone because um, uh, though you you said that you started in 2011, and but it is un until 2015, um, and we also see that uh, that transition was not happening. You were just uh, uh, some somewhere trying your hand at everything, anything and everything that that come came your way, and uh, that is amazing to see that in these five years, from where were you and how you have transformed your entire uh, photography skills to reach a level where people like us start counting you at that level, who probably you say that. Uh, you sought in for inspiration from, and that is quite phenomenal. Any particular uh, thought process that you were going through um, after 2015 that you uh, decided to move in a particular direction or take certain steps to reach this level, and and what was those those steps? Not in terms of post processing in particular we are talking about right now. Maybe in your thought process and your further decisions regarding. Um, how will you proceed and how will you approach a landscape image? Um, I, th I, I think I think there wasn't actually a lot of thought behind it. It was more like, oh, I like to do this, so I do that. And that was why I started talking about my identity, like where I come from, uh, big blockbuster movies, fantasy and so forth, because... I can sit and try and analyze and articulate uh, what it is specifically I went for. But I think it's easier to just say that I sought out what, um, what I responded to the most, the kind of photography I liked the most. I, I tried to do that. So when I looked at photos from yeah, as Joel Grimes uh, before 2015, but afterwards, like Ryan Dyer and Ted Gore, like really loved their photos. So without trying to completely em emulate their exact style of editing, I definitely wanted something like, you know, big, epic, sweeping vistas. And for the most part, when it comes to the compositional parts, like trying to make order out of this chaos that you often find in nature and with the big sweeping epic vistas and it, it's interesting when I look at it because a lot of the famous vista photos from around the world there's particularly one from Zion National Park where you look at a river and there's a mountain next to it and it's often like a golden hour shot it's one of those photos that I just don't like. Uh, and I don't think I even want to go for it if I even ever went to Zion National Park. So I started to become fairly critical of what it is I, I liked to look at. I saw a lot of the same photos from different places. Uh, and I saw that, okay, you know, uh, Skoafoss, the big waterfall, classic waterfall in Iceland, is, is a place that I really like the waterfall in and of itself. So... I can just continue shooting that and uh, try to make as much of an original shot as you can when you arrive there, because it is one of those places that has just been shot to death, one would say. I don't believe in that <laughs> sentence, but uh, it has been photographed quite a lot. And it is hard to make something which is just close to anything original. Uh, it has been photographed in all kinds of conditions with all kinds of people in front of it, with and without yellow rain jackets, red jackets, northern lights above it, uh, head torches on it, <laughs> and storms with rainbows. And yeah, so, you know, it's, it's getting harder and harder to make anything like, you know, original from those places. And I also think that over the years, that's especially what I feel now, that now that I know that I can actually do make 
decent photographs from those iconic places that I enjoy myself, still enjoy them, and I enjoy shooting shooting there. I, I do value way more to make original photos, like to actually do everything from start to finish, like do the exploration myself, find the compositions myself. And that's what I can really do in Denmark because it's not super over photographed. Uh, you can still do it in Iceland if you want to. You can also do it in the Faroe Islands, even though so many ph photographers go there. But uh, yeah. if you do it in Iceland, uh, you, you can't do it while hosting a workshop. So I would have to go up there myself because I have like an entire map of unexplored areas that I really want to go to in Iceland that I obviously haven't shared with anyone, but I know that there's great potential in those places. And from what I know, there are hardly any photographs from there. That, that's great. Um, um, so uh, is it fair to say that um, you got fascinated uh, by Iceland in 2015 and maybe in 2016 USA that you seriously decided to venture into landscape photography. Yeah. Yeah, most definitely. It, it, it confirmed that this was what I wanted to do and I could do it on myself, uh, for myself, on myself. I didn't uh, rely on other people like you do in portrait photography. You need to have a model who shows up and all those things. I can just do it on my own. So, uh, and, and for the most part, when I went on those travels, you know, you get got that feeling of going on a vacation, traveling far away and exploring uh, everything yourself. It was quite exciting back then. Um, it, it's still exciting, but I, I do feel that after five years, that initial excitement for going to a new location is not as big anymore it's other things that get gets me excited more today than it was back then that's great that's good i think sandeep has has a question for you sandeep um mas uh, i have a question for you uh, mm -hmm. you are a bit of an enigma for us uh, you are probably the first one who was open about his locations and you started a channel to show where you are shooting from and um, we grew up in a time when uh, people were hiding all their locations and this was all a big secret and you could not tell the other person um, uh, what was the location of the shot. So what made you think of uh, starting a channel which would um, uh, encourage photographers to go to new locations and shoot? What made you do that? Um, I knew that I fairly early through 2014, 2015, especially 2015, when I went to Iceland for the first time and then through 2016, uh, that I wanted to do something YouTube-ish with all the video material that I had filmed, uh, especially on my first tour to Iceland. Uh, and I just got even more on my second and third tour to Iceland. I hadn't even started my YouTube channel on, uh, on my, after my third tour to Iceland. Uh, I already had like two other YouTube channels, uh, with, which were one with fan trailers and one with all my gymnastic stuff. So I knew that YouTube was probably something I wanted to do. There weren't a lot of YouTubers back then, and there definitely weren't anyone sharing locations. And I decided instead of just making like a sampler, uh, like everybody did when they went to Iceland, they just put a two minute video together with all the best stuff from Iceland and put it on YouTube. I, I felt that with the amount of video material I had back then, that uh, it was kind of a waste just making a two minute video and, and then call it a day. So I actually decided to make a, a photography guide to Iceland. Uh, when I went there for the first time, I had like an, a PDF file with different locations uh, from Iceland. You could just, I think it's probably still online. You could just search for like photography locations, Iceland, and maybe it's yeah, probably buried quite a far down on Google by now. Um, but that was like my first inspiration to go to Iceland that I found, okay, this is quite good and got some inspiration for this and this. Um, so I kind of just did that, but in video format. And because nobody else did that, 
I guess in combination with my photos that people started noticing my YouTube channel because it was different from what was there back then. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, and then over time, uh, I added my US travels to it. And since everything Iceland I did uh, seemed to work, I just continued with that format uh, for a year or, or two-ish and, and kept having those logistics tips in there. And, you know, when you're just showing like the most iconic places, it's not like a big secret where they are. So not unless you start asking people to walk into private people's backyards, <laughs> it becomes controversial. Uh, but of course, like, you know, when, when you have made more than 50 videos from Iceland, you start to reach a, a, a point where some of these locations, if you want to make something new, that some of those locations are places that some of the local uh, farmers don't want you to go. So obviously I won't show those places. So you always have to like, especially with Iceland, when, when there are so many tourists, you, you obviously always have to like take into consideration what you can and what you cannot show. That was just like with my with my last batch of videos from Iceland, from the Highlands, uh, there were a lot of like local photographers who, oh, not local photographers, also people from outside who expressed concerns about showing specific locations from the Highlands because a lot of the locations in the Highlands, uh, uh, you, you, you can't bring a lot of people in there without like ruining the entire place. So obviously that is something you have to take into consideration. So if people want to go to the Highlands, they have to do all that research themselves. Uh, and usually people are lazy. So for the most part, they probably won't even go there because they can't find it. Oh, but I can yeah, tell you that. Uh, just see Prakash and myself, we were in Iceland in September 2017. And we were referring to your... Uh, YouTube tutorials all the time. We were watching mm -hmm. the videos all the time. So that was a great resource for us. That was great to hear. So our, pharaoh, our pharaoh was based on his map. <laughs> I was uh, talking to him basically on Messenger. Where should I go? <laughs> no, no, uh, see, there's an interesting story which I want to share, which even Prakash does not know. And I was going through um, uh, Mad's uh, videos on uh, pharaoh and I said, this seems to be a wonderful place to go. And the moment, it was the second day of me having, of, of watching those videos. And the moment I closed one video, I received a pop, um, a chat message from uh, uh, Prakash saying that, would you like to go to Faro? I said, man, <laughs> how, did he, how did he know that I am watching that video? I said, why not? So I don't know whether he felt that or not, but I said immediate yes, let, yes, let's go. No questions asked, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the pharaohs are is amazing. It, it's it's quite a lot different from Iceland because in Iceland and Norway and I think also in Sweden and uh, England they have this free roaming, so you can more or less walk where you want to walk as long as of course within reason. But in the Faroe Islands, everything is private land. So technically, even though they have so much land where nothing is walking besides a few sheep. Uh, it is private land, private property. So technically it is uh, walking into private property. And that is where they have within the Faroe Islands themselves a, a big debate uh, what to do with all the tourists because from the public side and from visit Faroe Islands, they of course have a, a lot of interest in getting a lot of tourists to the Faroe Islands. It, it's also about the local Faroese narrative that maybe just 10 or 15 years ago, it, it wasn't necessarily super cool being a person who came from the Faroe Islands. But now it is way more cool to be a person who comes from the Faroe Islands because the Faroe Islands is something. Um, but the thing is that even though the Faroe Islands is a small community of only 50,000 people, uh, there are like a lot of different opinions. And when you are a farmer in one place, which Go, goes viral like like we have that's like this very specific place called saxon where the the farmer just was overrun by tourists and and 
I completely understand why it's super frustrating yeah. because uh, who would want to have like 200 people walking into a backyard each day? <laughs> it, it's, it, it can be quite a problem. So there were, there's a lot of like ag- aggressive stories from, from that. So it, and, and visit Faroe islands seem to have not been, been good that that good at making all the contacts with all the local farmers before they started making all sorts of like influencer uh, inviting influencers into the Faroe Islands. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it's quite a new thing in the Faroe Islands to to have a lot of tourists. So they are a young nation in regard to tourism. So they will have to figure these things out as time goes by. And I, I don't think that that you can do this. Uh, have such an influx of tourists without also having problems with it. Uh, it's, it's what they have to figure out. And you see, just in Iceland, they, they blew up after the, uh, yeah, well, m- it's probably mo- ma- mostly the, the volcano uh, that blew up in 2010 that really put Iceland on the map. And yeah. after the economy completely crashed in 2008, they, they started to put a lot of effort into tourism. Uh, so within 10 years, you can see that even though it's a relatively short amount of time, they have actually done pretty well in managing this huge amount of tourists that come into our Iceland each year. It's like I think it's at least 2 million uh, tourists a year uh, when it was on the highest uh, a year or two years ago that came into Iceland, even though they're only like 350,000 people themselves. So... It, it takes effort with, with all kind of tourism. And when <laughs> the entire world starts to become more and more rich, the middle class becomes rich. And when you have very po- uh, populated countries like, you know, India and China opening up, so it's even easier. If there's just like one small country that will, goes viral, you just have like a ton of people coming in. Uh, to to a very small place, and that's what we see also in, uh, especially in Croatia, in that little town called Jubonik. Uh, Jubonik. Oh, what? I'm not sure what it's called, but it became famous because of uh, Dubrovnik. Yeah, Dubrovnik. Yeah, because of Game of Thrones. So there's almost no locals left in Dubrovnik. They live outside, <laughs> and everything is is now Airbnb. And we see the same in the center of Paris. I, I completely understand why the locals are frustrated and and, and sad about it. Um, but then again, it's also the locals who live from the tourism. Well, some of the locals, not all of them, but it, it, it's such an extremely hard debate. And when it comes to sharing locations on YouTube. Of course, you have to, to to tread carefully. In the beginning, it wasn't a big thing, but obviously it's something like, because I do it for the most part, uh, it is a, a debate that I follow very closely to see in what direction the wind blows, what I can show, what I can't show. Yeah, great. Um, I think Sarita has a question. Sarita? Yeah, hi, Matt. Uh, I'm an ardent fan of yours. And I have uh, three questions which I will ask straight off so you can you know, combine the answer. Uh, one is uh, you, are, uh, you got your big I mean, thought process change into a landscape photographer uh, in your Iceland tour in 2015, which is wonderful. And, but had you not gone to Iceland, had you gone to some cityscape space, I mean, do you think you would have had the same change or not, number one? Uh, number two is um, um, for a person like I'm really amateur. I'm into photography quite recently compared to all of you. And um, when I go to a place, I see a scene, but I have this uh, interest to capture something specific, which is uh, the essence of the place, which makes it very interesting for me. But, uh, you know, you, we are still captivated by the whole scene. So how do you go composing that uh, that that picture to capture just the essence of the place, which will tell its story in, from a small frame. And uh, how, what's your thought process and how do you compose that? I would be very uh, interested to know, though I've seen most of your videos and I'm a very big fan of following your channel. And the third question is you do those, um, uh, you know, the mistakes one shouldn't make in taking pictures. 
that's very good because that's an eye opener to people like me and uh, but what would be the three tips that you would give people who are beginner photographers uh, can we start with the first question again <laughs> first question is uh, Iceland 2015 was your big big breakthrough into uh, cementing your uh, thought process as a photographer for landscape photography yeah had you been instead had you gone to a cityscape place instead um yeah would you I, have would I, you I have do... still been a photographer <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I of course have done uh, a, a few different cityscapes, uh, but but it's mostly local here in Denmark. Uh -huh. uh, I, I also, of course, you know Reykjavik. When when you are in a in a big town like Reykjavik in Iceland, uh, you have to get the church photo, and there's also like a big culture house with some colors in it. It's yeah. also one you you want to photograph. So yeah, but when it comes to cityscapes, it was mainly like something I practiced with here in Aarhus before I went out to do landscape photographs. And when I found landscape photography, I was much more interested in that than, than photographing like buildings and stuff. And, and the second question was? Yeah, so you mean that nature, the, the, the landscapes that offered you the opportunity to actually really want to be more into photography than cityscapes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah, definitely. Had you, yeah. had you not seen so much amazing beauty in nature and natural beauty around you, it wouldn't have uh, really been able, you wouldn't have been able to justify your photography uh, life or whatever uh, the way you would look at it, journey. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> uh, as in, uh, had you not been to Iceland, which is, a, you know, an oasis of photographic uh, spots or landscapes, yeah. Uh, your transition, your transformation as a photographer uh, would have been so fast, so, so fast. Would have been much more difficult, much more different. <laughs> um, Because I, yeah, I'm from a city. I went to Iceland last uh, this year, and I'm like, uh, I've I've just uh, been in amazement since then. Yeah, so. yeah, okay, yeah, I understand. Yeah, definitely. Uh, if I hadn't gone to Iceland back in 2015 and, and was like, okay. I want to go there and I didn't have that experience of driving around up there for three weeks myself. Yes, yes. Where I utterly fell in love with Iceland and doing landscape photography uh, in, in that way. Then oh. I would probably not um, have gone in that direction that fast. Of course, I, when I came home, I did a lot of um, commercial videography and I still do, did some portrait photography um after my tour to iceland but i knew that that was what i wanted to do so my transition was still that i i That's promoted true. myself as a landscape photographer but i still took the jobs that put uh, bread on the table wonderful and the yeah, last um, one, something about the, the uh, last uh, the second one is uh, about composition at a place a spot for example you go to a diamond beach so i went there uh, with a personal guide And now, are you look around all around? You see a whole scene. You see lots of things. To isolate something into a unique composition, how how do you approach that? Can you, you with very, a with a picture? Can you explain it with a picture? Yeah, it, it it's uh, when it comes to the ice beach. Uh, let's see here. I'll just or any picture my... you can choose your picture when you see a yeah, whole yeah. scene and how do you isolate it for a composition? Yeah, I will. I will just uh, find my album here on my homepage. And so share screen and this one here. So here, here's my homepage. And okay. you, you can see when it comes to the ice beach, because it, it can be hard uh, yeah. to, to, to find something unique on the yeah. ice beach. Yes, because, I love this one. This one is absolutely phenomenal. Yes. Yeah, it, it, it's <sighs> for my part, what I usually do is I walk away from where you have like A, a big swarm of ice chunks and, and I go to the outer parts where mm -hmm. I, there's maybe like one or two uh, pieces of ice within the scene mm -hmm. and then I try to find the chunks of ice that stands out mm -hmm. uh, as you can see the, the round one here in front uh, it has a very unique shape and, and the one behind it is also have an interesting shape mm -hmm. because not all mm -hmm. chunks of ice looks like that with that pointy thing there 
Yeah. And then it's basically just about being there in the morning or when the light is interesting uh, mm-hmm. and then combine it with an interesting wave. Uh, I When I come away from the ice beach, I usually have between 500 and 1,000 photos that I have mm-hmm. to go through because I'm just hammering off and taking a lot of photos at once. And then out of those thousands, there's usually one or two, which are really great. Um, so when, yeah. when it, it, it's basically just about trying to find something that you find interesting. Um, and Making of course, a lot of editing goes into it. You have to see the potential in the place when you photograph it. What do you want to do with it? I, I have a pretty good idea what I want to do by now with, with the photos I get from the ice beach, uh, how to get the blue color a bit more out, make it pop, how to sharpen it and so forth. I know what shutter speed to use uh, when the waves come in and what shutter speeds to use when the waves go out. Uh-huh. Yeah, but uh, yes, that's very interesting. And this is a, yeah, mix the caves. Yeah. This so, is a composite, is it? Uh, technically, yeah, you would probably say it's a composite because I, I put uh, a couple the of photos cave. together, but it's mm-hmm. only the very upper part of, yeah. of this chunk of ice in front here uh-huh. uh, where, where I changed it a little bit. Um, I am underneath uh, a, a big uh, sheet of ice that like stands out and very oh, close to amazing. the water. Yeah, it it really was a, a really hard photo to get because the waves came up. I wanted uh, the waves to, to go in, in a specific way and you see this chunk here in, in front. Yeah, this is uh, that was rolling in and out, out with out. the waves all the time. So yeah, I had a, I didn't have a lot. I don't have a lot of photos from from this particular session because at one point a, a wave came up and kind of like splashed uh, my camera, and yeah. so I, I I had to uh, to to clean it. Uh, fair. <laughs> and and then when I came back, this piece of uh, sheet of ice which were standing there had tipped over. So, uh, so yeah, the, the, yeah, this is this the is... result of maybe like, I don't know, 20 or yeah, 30 pictures or something like that. Yeah, yeah. very nice. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Peter, for yeah. your uh, detailed answers yeah. and all. Uh, yeah. How about taking us through your, uh, some favorite images? Yes, I will do that. Yeah. So, Thank you. You are welcome. Let's see here. And yeah, so uh, do you guys know how hard it is to find your 15 favorite photos? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I, I, I couldn't really find my 15 favorite photos. So I, I found like 50 and then I just like started to delete every other and then I just <laughs> ended up with this. <laughs> uh, Mad, uh, your screen is not visible. Still, we are on the website. Okay, let's see here. Um, sharing and then reshare. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's because it is there. Oh. All right. Can you see the? That's can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. All right. So this first one here is from my very first evening in Iceland as a landscape photographer. Um, for some weird reason, I, I didn't expect uh, after three weeks in Iceland to actually see the northern lights, but I got them on the very first night, uh, a big coronal ejection. And when I found out there was northern lights, I was on my way to uh, to my guest house. So I was just like super excited. I, I checked into my guest house, threw everything in, and then I drove 40 minutes back to uh, to this volcano uh, where I actually wanted to do some night photography and photograph the Milky Way from there. But with the Northern Lights, I was like, okay, let, let's go for the Northern Lights instead. So I climbed up on the top of this uh, big volcano crater during nights with a lot of wind, but with the Northern Lights dancing above for the first time as a photographer in Iceland, seeing this insane phenomena, the Northern Lights uh, are the first time you see it. And I walked around this volcano crater during night uh, on the entire, entire rim of it, that's like three kilometers around it, just to have different foregrounds uh, for, the, for the northern lights. And that was, that was, I would probably say that was that what cemented my interest for landscape photography. If this is what landscape photography is, this is what I want to do, because that is one of the 
most existential uh, experiences I've, I've ever had. Like I, I was crying and I was yelling and uh, yeah, I was just on myself out in the wilderness photographing the Northern Lights. That was just insane. I was dancing around on top of a volcano crater during night. That was weird. <laughs> and then I have this photo here. Uh, that was also like, uh, that is in the completely other spectrum of the big epic vistas. This is way more moody, way more like fine artsy. I really love this shot. Uh, the Black Church in Iceland was also fairly photographed back then. So of course I wanted to go there, photograph it. And I got this shot. It's very different from the raw file, the, the editing here, but it's just one of, well, it, it's my best selling photo uh, ever. The one that has earned me the most. And it, it is just a shot that is very special to me because it was like, ah, oh, okay, I can also do moody, fine art, desaturated stuff. I really enjoy that too. But did you get any flack for uh, centering your subject? No, no. Okay. Like it's uh, I working here. Yeah, I, I've, I've all, always enjoyed. That stop people. Yeah, it, it only stops photographers. <laughs> It, it, the, the problem with photographers when they learn photography is that you have to follow certain rules um, in photography to be a good photographer. But uh, you have to put yourself in the place of those who don't do photography. And this is such a stylistic, straight on, simple, minimalistic photo that if I had followed the rule of thirds, it completely wouldn't work. Like, you know, putting the church a little bit out to, to the right or to the left, it wouldn't make any sense. This just begs to be placed straight in the middle. It's such a powerful shot. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I, I think I've heard one photographer who felt that over time, because I do all these central compositions, that he felt that some of my photos starts to become a little bit boring. Um, and of course, like if, if you see my entire portfolio over time, uh, of, of course, it can be a little bit, you know, like boring if I always place my subject straight in the middle. Luckily, I don't do that, but it works. Uh, that's why I love the central composition. It's simple. Uh, and that is usually what people love if they want to, uh, to buy a fine art photograph. They don't want hyper complex scenes with exploding sunset colors. They they rarely sell. They look good on Instagram, but they rarely sell. And uh, this shot here, also one of my super top favorites. This is my favorite photo I got away from uh, the US. I was waiting for the super moon. I actually wanted to photograph the super moon above. You can see it's half dome uh, from Yosemite right there in the middle. But just before the, the moon came out from behind uh, El Capitan, you can see the cliff on the, the left, it threw the moonlight into Yosemite Valley and lit, it, lit everything up. And I was just like, whoa, I have to photograph that. So I put the long lens on, 200 millimeter, and, and I got the shot. It is not even that much edited, this one here. I would show that later. Uh, but you can actually see there's a lot of small lights on the uh, on the rock on the left, uh, which is climbers on El Capitan sitting there during night with the headlamps and, and so forth. So uh, if you know that detail, it's quite a nice photo. Then I have this one. Uh, this is probably my favorite uh, Milky Way composite uh, from the Mesquite Sand Dunes. This is two different crop versions. It's the same photo, I just cropped it differently. Uh, and, I, and I made these like very vertical panoramas. This one won in that Epson panoramic competition they have each year for vertical panorama and for, yeah, they have like a category for composites and, and very highly edited photos. So it actually won two uh, categories in one competition, which was, uh, you know, nice pat on the back. Uh, and then this one here, also one of my all time favorites from the Faroe Islands. Uh, highly inspired by a French photographer called uh, Alexandre Duchesne. Duchesne, I think it's pronounced. 
he haven't taken this shot here, but he has a photo from Iceland where he the sun is fairly low and he has like a very uh, thick cloud above him. And he just had like this line of the mountains uh, in a big panoramic uh, set. And I was like, oh, this is completely like, like that one. So while we were being hammered with sleet and rain here, uh, I managed to get my camera out and just took a handhold photo of, uh, of this scene here. And it uh, became one of my all time favorite photos. So just like the one from Yosemite here, I hadn't planned them. It was something else I came for, but the, the weather just happened. And then I was there to take the photograph. This one here, I had planned something more or less like this one here. Uh, also from a first time in the Faroe Islands, we walked along this uh, brink on a mountain uh, top uh, and I found a place where I could put Sophie on, on those stones there in the foreground and take the shot. I have a lot of different versions, but I really like this one because the wind just takes her hair and, and makes that S curve, which is kind of mirrored in, in the background fjords. Uh, and then I edit it to my delight. The light there in the background is uh, something I've uh, put in there because uh, the light was actually like, if we're looking like, you know, at 12 o'clock, the light was at like four o'clock. So it was a little bit behind me instead of straight in front of me. But uh, you can do a lot with Photoshop to make your photos look great. This one here from Wales, absolutely love it. Super moody. It was uh, one of, it was just such a rainy day. It was even, uh, I think there was one lightning strike not uh, far from us uh, in one of these clouds. And I knew I wanted a shot from this location here. We hiked up uh, and I knew I wanted that mountain there in the background. Uh, and it was just about finding the, the right part of the stream in front. There's a lot of waterfalls in the stream. And I have some photos from the waterfalls, which are a little bit further down, but I ended up actually preferring this one. Uh, it was a bit more unique with the foreground because everybody takes the shot with the with the waterfalls in the foreground. So I really like this composition, which like it's like framed all the way around and you follow the the stream around the picture into the mountain and then into the light there in the background. Again, a shot I, I really wanted to visit this location in the in the Lake District in England. Uh, but I obviously hadn't planned that we would be standing there in the middle of a shower. And, and this shower came in and suddenly the clouds uh, just, I saw that this hole in the clouds might line up with the tree. So I was just waiting while being hammered by rain uh, to see that, uh, that, yeah, they lined up and then I got it when it was. So this is like one shot. Uh, a lot, not a lot of editing, but I darkened it down quite a lot, a lot of Dutch and burning, but it is like one frame, not composite or anything like that. This one here, uh, again, just having the light there in the background, just absolutely insane when we came up there. It was a bit of like, you know, moody day, but but not crazy weather at all. It was just overcast. And when we come, came up, the light, uh, the, the clouds kind of started to break up. And then at one point, you just had the light that just sh shone in behind this mountain uh, in, in both the, the valleys on, on either side. And it was just like incredible. I've emphasized the light a little bit, but this was, was more or less like how I saw it. This one here is actually a shot that I really, really like. Uh, it was on my very last day in England. And even though it's not like, you know, particularly epic weather, it is just so atmospheric. And I really love the depth, the layers of it. And it is just when the fog, morning fog uh, starts to, to evaporate. And this is just like, when, when people talk about England, this is how I think of it. It's just like very, very moody. It looks like something out of uh, that TV series, uh, Vikings. There's, whenever they're in England, there's always 
fog or smoke in the background. So they have a lot of like smoke machines going on. So this is how I think of it. This shot here from the Alps, also one of my absolute favorites uh, with the light just coming in. Usually you see like quite a wide angle shot from this place. Uh, when I shot this one, I hadn't seen anything that was zoomed in and I, I went there to get like a wide angle shot, but this was just so obvious when the light came in from the side. I had I could place Sophie there in the background and just have the, the light come in. This one shot here from uh, Iceland, heavily, heavily edited. Uh, this is a combination. This is what you would call a, a focal length blended uh, time blend, <laughs> I think. Um, so I was just waiting for getting a lot of shots for the foreground here with the uh, with the waves getting optimal shots there. And then I focused on the background to get uh, get the lights exactly as I wanted on the mountains, put that together. And then a lot of editing to just like pull out the uh, all the details. But very representative of what we saw that day. If you have seen the, my video from Astrohorn in Iceland, it, it was quite like this. Very, very am amazing sunset. This one here, also one of my favorites uh, from the Faroe Islands. We would, we would just, this is like a fairly common vantage point where you photograph the largest waterfall in the Faroe Islands. And it was one of those days where you just wanted to like, you know, stay in bed because there was a huge storm up there and it was fairly safe driving out, but there was a lot of wind and a lot of rain. So when the wind come from the right uh, direction, it pushes the waterfalls back up the mountains. And as you can see, this is the largest water waterfall in the Faroe Islands. So there's a lot of wind power going on here. And I was just getting, getting pushed around and uh, I just had to go out very fast to take the photo. Uh, I was just getting drenched and hammered around by the winds. and didn't have time to set up uh, my tripod or anything like that so yeah just hammering off and the raw file is very very flat so but adding a lot of contrast to it actually put pushes out all the details so this is one of my very fav favorite photos and this one here also one of those photos that just cemented to me that i can actually make nice photographs from denmark from a, a lighthouse up in uh, up in northern denmark this is actually on top of a dune during winter and just had a lot of snow being blown around in the uh, in the area. It looks as if I'm in the middle of a snowstorm. Uh, and yeah, there was a lot of snow being blown around, but it wasn't really a snowstorm. If you've seen my video from there, it's mainly snow in the foreground that I used to, to create this effect where it looks as if the lighthouse is being, yeah, standing in the middle of a snowstorm. Very moody, very dramatic. This one here also from the Faroe Islands, really love that one. Uh, it's, it's one of those that I'm also really proud about because I actually did the leg work. I explored this area myself. I haven't seen anyone else photograph uh, from this place in the Faroe Islands. Um, so yeah, it, it, fantastic day. Like this was like a little oasis landscape photography paradise, this area, because you have like mountains in the background, a clear foreground, and I could make that very dramatic depth photo, very moody. Looks as if it, the clouds look like a dragon around the mountains up there. And this photo here, again, I've talked about it a lot in my videos. Uh, I really loved it really cemented that I, okay, I can go out in Danish nature during summer in what outside of the golden hour and actually take a photo that I'm very happy about. It's very optimistic. And whereas these photos here are very moody, very dark, I really like to also make optimistic photos uh, because I'm, yeah. I'm out all, all winter in Iceland. It's very cold, it's very dark. So it's very nice that I can also take photos during summer in Denmark that I really appreciate because this is just like, you know, this could, this could be any forest in Denmark. 
So I did all the legwork myself. I found it myself. I just followed my intuition and my curiosity. And I found this scene. I waited for the light to be right and I got the shot. Again, uh, from my own exploration in Denmark, waiting for optimal conditions with a foggy morning went out. I kind of knew about this composition. I wasn't aware that it would be this good when I was there. So uh, yeah, got it. Probably my favorite photo from last year. And this one here, I actually to took it in November, but I didn't release it before this year. This is one of those uh, that are just like, over the years, when I take landscape photographs from these big epic locations, I really like to use myself as a model or someone else as a model, as you've seen in some of the photos, because it just gives so much to the scale and the understanding of the scene. And as you can see, I, I will show you how I edited this photo later. And this is close to what I saw in reality, but at the same time, also far from what I saw in reality. So uh, we'll get some tips and tricks to how I edited this one. But I, I really like this. It's so powerful. It's so powerful. And this one here is also a photo I really wanted for a Can long I ask time. Can you a question on the previous image? Yeah, sure. Um, when you go to a scene, I have seen many of your photos, you use a human element, okay? So when you go to your place or any scene, do you plan or it's just on the spot? How you do it? it uh, I will talk more about it in depth later, but but it, it, it differs, it differs. In this particular case, I was just like, I, I saw almost immediately that I could get something like this here. Uh, I, I could see that there was a reflection there in the background in because um, this it, it is ice in front of the glacier. It's not water. So it is ice where they have fall, there's no snow on it. So I got we got this very clean reflection. And just seeing this part of the glacier where you, you can you can kind of see how they go out to either side. I could see that there was a very strong composition there if I just used the long lens. And if I could combine that with myself in the foreground, uh, I, I, I knew that that would potentially be a really, really strong photograph. So when I got it, I already knew back then that he has a great potential for a photograph. I remember I, I, sh I showed it in my stories on Instagram when I had got this, that photo. I, I was so confident when I got this photo that I knew that it was one I would, would like very, very much. And yeah, it turned out to be one of my po most popular photos on Instagram ever. So Thanks. it works for Instagram. I haven't sold any of uh, any prints of it yet, but uh, I'm, I'm not really much into selling prints, at least not yet. <laughs> so uh, yeah, and this one here, this was just, a, again, just like a dream shot of mine. I really wanted to, to have a shot of Rainy Stranka, these very iconic cliffs in Iceland with a lot of uh, backlit waves in front. I've seen a few photos uh, like this. And it's one I've had in my mind for like a year or two. Uh, the conditions just never were for it whenever I, I visited. So it wasn't actually before like a few months ago when I was there uh, in, I was, uh, in the beginning of March, uh, this photo is from. All right, so, uh, so that, was, that was it for all my favorite photographs. So what is next on the... Yeah, <laughs> they, are, they are amazing because if I look at this image also, I've, I've been to uh, this particular spot every time we've been there. But unfortunately, we've not been blessed with so much light and so much drama uh, there. And uh, so um, images... You have to be there at, at the right time of year uh, during like winter-ish season yeah. because you need to have you, you're looking more or less from this direction you're looking like south west so you need to have the sun in an angle so that it is behind the water you can this is fairly sightlit but still from behind so it's just in the winter season you have to be there and with the sun out maybe you're talking about uh... Pure winter or, or maybe October, November kind of situation or December? Uh, this was in the beginning of March. 
So <laughs> it's actually fairly close to the equinoxes. Uh, this is sunset. Uh, you could probably get something like it uh, during sunrise, but then it will have to be closer to uh, uh, winter solstice. OK, fantastic. Uh, we have few question Matt, uh, Matt's in the YouTube and uh, I would like to take them up before we move ahead. Yep. One is from um, Abhishek Patra. He's asking that to photograph landscapes, would you only go to iconic locations like Iceland or Faroe? Or, um, or uh, can they be done locally as well? So um, I don't know what is the meaning of the last sentence. But uh, the main thing is that would you only go to the iconic locations or no, no, absolutely not. Uh, for a long time, um, I can feel, especially the past year since I've started photograph more in Denmark, uh, I, I still like and enjoy going to the iconic locations because they are iconic for a reason. They are absolutely spectacular. And I have a long list of iconic locations that I want to go to still because like... It, I guess when you're a landscape photographer, you really do enjoy the landscapes. And even though like they are iconic, they are, they are still a feast for the eye to just look at and experience. Um, and the reason why I went to all the iconic places in the beginning was simply because I was drawn to those and I could get the kind of photos that I wanted to make at the iconic locations. Uh, they were very exotic to me. Um, because in Denmark, we don't have waterfalls. We don't have cliffs. We don't have any crazy weather. We don't have big storms. We do have storms, but tornadoes and, and all those, to me, exotic things. Um, so I could get that in Iceland and the Faroe Islands fairly easily. Uh, yeah. But I have, over the past year, I, I can feel on myself that I have probably moved a bit closer to what you would call a classic landscape photographer because I've become more interested in my local landscapes in, in Denmark as a landscape location. I do less post-processing on my photos from Denmark because I'm more interested in documenting the landscape than creating these well, what you will fantasy images even though they are from iconic locations they, they are as you said in in the beginning they're very much out of this world like you you wouldn't go to that place and see exactly what mass photographed um yeah so i i can definitely feel a switch in myself i still enjoy making photos like the one here from rainy stranger but when it comes to the danish landscape photography i i'm more focused on on the landscape for the sake of the landscape that, that's a wonderful answer. You're more interested in landscape for the sake of the landscape. And that, and that actually, I think, uh, you know, sums it, the entire answer up, and, and that's more important. Uh, there is another question um, and from uh, Dr. R. Palyani Raman. Uh, in, the, in past, you were, you were taking hundreds of images to nail one, probably. And now, as your expertise grows, do you take so many images or only a few images to really get the, get the one final image? Uh, it depends a little bit on the location and it depends a little bit on uh, what my idea is. I have so many techniques. So if, you, if you're doing a, a time blend, I, I still do a time blend from time to time. Um, so I, I can maybe end up with like 200 photos of waves crashing against rocks that I only need for maybe one shot I know for, for, for the background. I would still say I, I probably do take just as many photographs now as I did back then, but I'm probably faster at recognizing which one of those photographs is the one I want to edit to make, make for the final edits. It's probably that I'm, I'm, I'm probably better at recognizing the great photos. Great, great. There's one more question from Nakul. Now he's asking that since I'm following him, he always shares his vision and not to emphasize more on the particular setting for shooting. Um, so, but do it with the heart, which is very important along with the story. So can you, can you share your thoughts on that? Um, you do not. Can I, can, I, can I have the question again? Can I, can I have the question one more time? 
Yeah, he says that um, you do not emphasize too much on the particular setting of the camera while creating an image. Or instead, you try and share your feelings and your story behind it. And uh, yes. so, what is your thought uh, with that? Why, why do you do that? And is is technical probably important, or do you still feel that it is your emotions and your connect with the image or this location which is more important? Uh, I, I I think it's because I'm more interested in creativity than in the techniques. To, the techniques are just like you know a tool to get whatever creativity is inside yourself out there. Yeah. Um, I am so lucky these days. It's something I would uh, I will talk with another photographer about in in, in a few days. We will release. Um, but I don't have to deal a lot with the limitations of my camera. Uh, modern cameras are so insanely good. High megapixels, high dynamic range, all those things. Like when I started out, when I did HDR, it was also to overcome the limitations of the dynamic range. But these days, for the most part, I can actually get away with a, with, with a single exposure um, if I just need a single exposure, if it's not for time blending or anything like that. So I don't really want to delve too much on the techniques because I honestly just find it super boring. Uh, and, and especially when, when it comes to landscape photography settings, it's like, you know, ISO 100 F11, let the shutter be whatever the shutter is. It's, it's unless you specifically want a, a long exposure, then you put it in maybe not shutter speed priority, but into manual and yeah, and yeah. then you base the settings on that. It, it's not magic. It, it, it's just the camera is just a tool to get whatever creativity you want out of yourself. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. I think that is uh, that's probably the perfect answer to to this because um, camera is just a tool, and and uh, and in in modern days, uh, there, there's very hard to differentiate between which is a good camera and which is a bad camera. Every camera is a good camera. So it all boils down to your creativity and, and how you really differentiate. And that becomes the differentiator as well, probably. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's funny when, when we talk about it, because obviously my most popular YouTube videos are all those about the, the technical stuff. <laughs> like the one I released yesterday about how to get sharp photos is yeah, my most popular yeah. video <laughs> like ever. Like in, in 24 hours, it got more than 10,000 views. And, and it's just like, okay, I can, I can go and make those videos. <laughs> but I don't feel particularly enriched by that. So, so these days, uh, at least for the past month, I like switch between, okay, I make a technical or oriented video for, for maybe a Sunday release. And then I make a more creativity oriented video for my Tuesday releases. So tomorrow you will, you will see one, which is completely focused on feeling and why and you can see there's a, an, another side of excitement to what I'm doing compared to when I'm just talking about how to get your photos focused or sharp. Would love to watch that yeah. Um, there is one more question though you have answered one part of it uh, but still it is by Sanak and he says how much editing goes into your photos and I think you've already shared that at times too much. But uh, the second part is important. I think that would be, everybody would be keen to know that. And how do you decide on the final outcome? How do you decide that now it is done? And this is the final that you want to, this is the uh, final image that you want to share. Um, when there is not more about the photo that bothers me. <laughs> That's a wonderful answer. <laughs> it, like, you know, I, for, for, for this shot here, you, you will see it. Uh, I, I will see how, how I made it. And this is also a time blend. Um, the foreground wave here uh, yeah. in, in, in this shot here is, is one I have edited in there. And then the rest of the photos, one frame. But you, you can kind of get an idea about when I want to stop uh, through the few examples I found I want to go through. Okay, so uh, now another extension to this question uh, is that do you, um, let's say you finish now and uh, uh, do you give yourself time before you decide this is final or, or you decide almost immediately? Absolutely. Uh, you have to. You, you cannot sit and edit 
without keeping making breaks in between all the time. And at least when I think I'm done, I wait for a day and look at it again. And I, I'm like, how could you be so blind? But, but it, it's simply, it's a phys physiological process that when you look at a photo, your eyes start to normalize what you are watching. So you might be sitting with a, a photo that only takes up half the histogram and you think it's the most contrasty photo you have ever taken. And then you look on it, on it the day after and you're like, how could I not see that there were no black levels in that shot? So when I edit, uh, I, for the most part, uh, try to fill out the entire histogram just to get a, a proper amount of, of contrast in my photos. Um, it, it, again, it's a rule of thumb. I don't do it to all my photos. But, but when you sit and edit, you, you, you just become blind. I, I can't explain explain the physiological process, but it's just what it is. And at some point, you you have to you, you have to put it away, and then you have to look at it again. And and I'm also a little bit colorblind, so I'm having a little bit of difficulties with with seeing the like desaturated greens and desaturated reds. Uh, and and it's it's not that I'm switching them around; it's just that I simply do not see them. Um, they 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 just become less saturated. Okay. So, and especially magentas also. Mm -hmm. So it, it's something that I have to deal with quite a lot in my photos that uh, I have like, I put in a few saturation layer on top of my Photoshop and just crank up the saturation all the way up. And I can see what colors are in the photo and how strong they are. And then I can start removing magentas and so forth. If I can see there's some unwanted magentas, uh, greens. Yeah. There's another question that just popped in my mind uh, right now, uh, slightly. Uh, has it ever happened to you that uh, you were just sharing a story about your YouTube video and it became popular that you didn't like it? You, you don't enjoy doing that. But has it ever happened that you edited an image which looked perfect, you posted it, and you immediately realize that, nah, this is, this is not um, of the same standard that I wanted to create. But since you posted it, so you posted it. And it goes on to become the biggest hit. Most popular. <laughs> yeah, just when we when we tested out this, I have that uh, story about one of my more popular photos. Uh, I can just show it. It's in uh, my homepage. Let's see here. Uh, give me two seconds. Yeah, so this one here and here. There we go. Yeah, so this photo here, you 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 can see it from Stocksness. Yeah. 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 So this, this shot here, I have this love-hate relationship with it because it is definitely one of my most popular photos, but it's for Instagram. Like I, I haven't sold any uh, prints of it, but it's fairly popular on Instagram. But when I shot it, it was actually, I was standing there with a lot of clients uh, and I was just showing, okay, how can you make a long exposure and use the waves when they come in with a long short long exposure just to get like a leading line towards the mountains so i had this shot when i came back home and i was like eh, i kind of like the leading line but that's about it so i just started playing around with it in a in camera raw and i could see that i could probably make a very highly contrasty photo so i actually made it black and white and really just pumped a lot of contrast into it heavy heavy vignetting and all those things and then i moved the the black and white or the saturation slide a little bit in so i got a little bit more blues in there and at some point i was like okay i kind of like how simple the colors are but it was really just a photo that i just i didn't think about it it was just there to show someone else and when i edited it i was just like la 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 and then okay yeah i can see that it is powerful but it is one of those photos where i'm like I hate that I kind of like it <laughs> because <laughs> I, I, I don't feel I deserve it in any way because, yeah, you know, but then again, it's just creativity. I just went with whatever, uh, but I don't feel I thought much about it. I didn't put any many thoughts into it, but, you know, I, yeah. So I have this love hate relationship with it. I have other photos from, from this place that I, feel I like even more, way more uh, as the one, let's see where it is, probably further up. Yeah, this one here. So this one here, that was way more intentional. It was a, on, a, on a day again with like, terrible weather. 
oh well boring weather it wasn't raining or anything there was just like no light the clouds were boring we had a little bit of sea mist coming in but that was about that the beach were kind of boring the waves were kind of boring but i did find this place where all the water came in from the waves uh, went around in a little pool and then they slowly got out again with with the sea foam and i figured that if i hit the right shutter speed then I could get these nice streaks back out into the water. Uh, and it actually worked. Like I only need like 10 or 11 tries. And, uh, and and I found the right shutter speed and I found the right time when I got it. And I knew when I got it, I was like, yes, this is the one. And then I edited it. It's been a little bit of time editing it um, to, to find the contrast and so forth. Like I worked much more for this photo. So I feel I deserve it more. Uh, it is more yeah you know intentional than the other one is this one is also popular but i do think that yeah this the other is, one is probably more popular <laughs> this is amazing this is the way uh, this is perfect example of how one should be shooting slow shutter uh, when the waves are crashing in and going back and and, and receding so this yeah. is one this is also a shot that i would much rather prefer to hang on my own wall than the other one than the other one but uh, but I, like if, if other people like my other shot more, like I'm not blaming them for it. It's just how it is. <laughs> great, great. Um, anybody has any question? Prakash, Som, Som has been quite. Uh, I I will go. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So um, it is um, um, when you um, you know lots of your sort that we have as we as I have seen and you know as you have mentioned throughout your session that you know. Sometimes your weather is dull and you probably have to sometime, you know, create light. So what technique is your, um, or which is your favorite technique to create, or, you know, if you want to enhance light or, you know, falling angle, something like that. So what is your favorite technique that you use? Do you, you know, simply dodge burn or, or, you know, creating a layer. So can you probably give us a quick, you know, walk through that? How do you create lights when there is a really dull moment or something like that? Or three dimensionality in your shots, which is really, you know, very nice to see on all of your shots. Yeah, um, you will probably see it when, when I show the the photos. But yeah, dodge and burning is one of these. Like, uh, you can do it in so many different ways. So obviously, yeah, I dodge and burn because I, I bring a, I add basically just more contrast, uh, sometimes more locally than than other times, and I generally add. If it's not already there, a kind of flare to the photos. So some light coming in from the direction of where the light comes from. So you can see on the first photo here, even though the light does come in from the left, uh, I did add a flare to this one also to simulate a little bit more atmosphere and some mist and, and, and so forth. So in, in, in that way, it just, adds a lot to the atmosphere and to the lights. So it, it's it's just putting like, you know, a radial filter uh, and, and, and adding that in a, in Lightroom or camera roll, use the radial filter or in Photoshop, you can render one of those uh, flares yourself and then of course manipulate it. But yeah, I, I usually add a little bit just to give it like a little bit more atmosphere and a little bit more interest, a little bit more light. Fantastic. Atunu, anything more? Um, sorry, I was speaking. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I'm very interesting. Thank you. So, adding fair is a something um, I had not heard before, but that's that's very nice to know. Thank you. You are welcome. Storm. Uh, Mads. Yeah. Hey. Uh, so I, I saw a lot of your shots. Uh, again, pretty white, bright light, less yellow skies, right? No, mm -hmm. so I, I think when people say that they get the best of Arctic from you, I think it's because of the white skies. That's probably one of the reasons driving it. Uh, very unsaturated skies. Is that something that you do by choice? Uh, because it, you know, it personifies or it, 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 it kind of basically, you know, uh, projects the cold and the harshness. Is that by choice? Yeah, I, I definitely like the more 
muted colors. If there are colors, you can see like if there's a rainbow, I of course want to emphasize the rainbow. And, and if there is a sunrise, I, I want to emphasize that. But I often see a lot of photos out there where uh, the colors are like completely blown out. And it, it is just as if they have taken the saturation slider like up by 50. And I, I just don't like it. it, it to me, it looks... Um, I wouldn't say the word unnatural because I'm literally making unnatural photos, but but it, it, my eyes just don't accept it. It, it looks weird to my eyes uh, if there's that much color uh, in a photo. And yeah, it, I can also see that the details in those highlights, especially the reds, they very easily blow out. So I don't mind blowing out highlights if it's done deliberately. Uh, you can see probably on, on this photo here that where the sun comes from, that is technically blown out, but you don't really notice that it's blown out because it's like, you know, it, it, there's such a, a gr nice graduation uh, gradation uh, from the highlights into the, into the clouds. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I just don't like pushing the colors too much. I like colors. As you can see, I'm hardly doing any black and white photographs, but I, I I don't want to like, you know, overdo it. I want that people accept what they look at. Uh, and I can only measure that by my own eyes. So it's what I, my own eyes accept to look at. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question, but. <laughs> no, I, think, I think that was a perfect answer. Okay. I caught my eye, so I thought I would ask. Okay. Anybody, Prakash, anything? Sarita, Sandeep? No, he said he will explain the... Yeah, I, I would love to, uh, love, love to see Matt's uh, process. Yeah, so let us, I think let us head to that now. All right. So uh, do some processing. Let's see here. Uh, let, do, 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 do. We have to go to this Fine. one. So you see my Photoshop now? Yes. Yeah. Can. Yes. All righty. So I have you guys standing out there on the side. I'll just hide you. Okay. So of course I, I do quite a lot of Photoshop and I think I will just start with one of the other ones. So I'll start with this one. Mm -hmm. And uh, you will be surprised when I, I, I don't want to edit it from, from the, from the bottom up. I'll just show you all the different layers I made. And if I just hide all the other layers, how it looked after I had had it through camera raw, and it's like this. So it's a huge difference. Um, if I double click here and I go into camera raw, you can see I haven't done much to it. I've changed the exposure. I've cropped it a little bit. Uh, and yeah, just done all, all the basic stuff, but generally haven't really done anything. And then of course the crop. I knew that when I took this photo, that the parts I really liked, can, can you see my mouse? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So the parts I really liked were these uh, pieces of ice here and here, and how they were like reflected in the ice underneath here, and, and this triangular shape here in the middle. So I knew I wanted that, I knew I wanted to center it. But from this particular angle where I could get an optimal photo of myself standing down here, uh, I couldn't get the exact angle I wanted. I had to walk like 20 meters further to the left to, to just get a little bit other angle. So as you can see here, when I put in this other shot, this is actually taken from another angle. And then I have just enlarged it a tiny amount, just a little bit more. So it gives a completely other perspective. But the thing is, I couldn't put myself in front of this shot because there was like a, a big iceberg here in the middle. So I couldn't get it from the optimal angle. So this is a good example of how this is technically not time blending. It's technically not uh, focal length blending, but uh, let's call it perspective blending. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so, so I simply just added that in instead. And then I just started cleaning up the photo uh, with a lot of different cleaning layers. You can see just by removing the camera bags down there from some of the other uh, people there, 
the stones and all those things, it makes a huge difference to, to the photo. Then I did a little bit of liqu liquefying and removing some of the ice sheets down here. So simply just to, to force some of the ice out from one side and clean it up, put myself in another location, just straight in the middle. And again, just all, all these small details that annoys my eye. You can see it's a little bit brighter down here. Just removing that, adding a little bit, then adding some brightness contrast. Probably this is a, this is a luminosity mask you can see. And I just added some contrast to the highlights, cleaned up a bit more. And just like, you know, going with the flow, the foreground part here doesn't really match with the background. So I'm trying to add a layer. So I'm making sure that the brightness and the contrast values and the colors match better. And a little liquefying layer more just to remove. You can see there's a lot of this is like what I would call a high contrast area out here on the left. So I'm just dragging that out of the photo. And I, in this particular case, I just chose to liquefy it. Uh, so I just added a little bit of tonal contrast with the Nick collection uh, software, just to bring out a little bit of the highlights in the eyes. I sharpened it, added a little bit of autumn effects darkened down the foreground a bit more, added some vignetting, cleaned up a bit more, pushed the highlights a little bit more also, uh, brightened up the highlights, darkened it a little bit more in the foreground. And yeah, let's see here what I've done here. Yeah, again, you can see here on my luminosity mask, it's targeting all the highlights of the eyes and I'm bringing up the brightness and contrast in that part. And, and that is a fairly easy way to dodge and burn your highlights. You're simply just doing it by luminosity masking. Put a brightness contrast layer, put a luminosity mask on it, and then bring up the brightness and contrast. And yeah, just adding some, well, removing a little bit of the brightness in the corner. And yeah, as you can see here, basically just balancing the lights in the scene, so before and after. It's a little bit too dark here and a little bit too bright here. And I just compensate for that. What do I do then? Clean a little bit more, darken down the top a little bit more and adding a little bit more brightness to the highlights. So yeah, I simply just go through the photo and whenever there's something that bothers me, uh, I do something about it. And then at some point, uh, after some days when there's nothing that I want to change with it, I, I kind of feel that I'm done with this shot. So before, after, and it, it's mainly that second layer here that did the big difference, finding the optimal perspective. Yeah. Oh, really great. So, yeah, another one here. This is also like, you know, you're standing at night photographing the northern lights, you found your foreground, you found your composition. <laughs> and when I photograph the northern lights, I find my composition and I take a lot of shots for the foreground uh, to have a clean foreground because I'm shooting a quite high ISO. And uh, then I combine it and remove the, uh, the noise afterwards. So you can see here how I went by it. Uh, so this is like my, my base shot, which is a combination of probably 10 shots I took from this place. Uh, and there's not a lot of like Northern Lights. We were waiting for it. So I could just like make my foreground layers. And then when the Northern Lights started to pop, I could uh, start photographing them without moving the camera. This is like one direction, but it is a, what you would call a time blend. So a little bit of Northern Lights from one shot, a little bit of Northern Lights from another shot, a little bit more here from the last shot. So my base photo, as you can see here, my base time blend is actually four different photos. And then again, I just started as before, uh, adding contrast and brightness to the different parts of the photo that I want to emphasize, clean it up 
always clean your photos just to make them yeah more aesthetic to look at emphasize whatever you want to emphasize you can see in this particular case here uh, you can see all my masks out here on the on the right so i've just targeted the northern lights and just brought up the brightness of the northern lights just to make them pop a little bit more and same here and then i made sure to only add that effect to the right part of the northern lights and not the left part because they are already so bright then i removed a bit of the blues and some noise reduction noise reduction some sharpening and yeah just adding more contrast brightness i think this is an autumn effect again balancing the light i think it's too bright out here on the left just darken it down and then there was this snow down here because of all the contrast i've added it has become more contrasty so I removed some of the contrast from that snow. I removed a lot of the saturation from the piano because it's, I, I guess it has like, it's fairly brown, but because of the location, probably some of the shots that I took, some car lights might have lit the piano up. So I removed some of the colors for that just not to make it pop too much. And yeah, Again, just darken down some of the brightest parts of the photo here, the background and the piano. And the last one here where I'm just darkening down the waves here in the background so they don't take up too much attention of the photo. So before and after. That's fantastic. Just one question here, uh, Matt. Yeah. Um, what was the time that you took the initial, the first image where there are no northern lights and and um, so what is what was the difference between the first shot and probably the shots when the northern lights started appearing? Mm, I don't remember how long time we were there. We 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 as you can see, it's it's a it's a night where there's a, some moon behind mm. us to light up the scene. <clears throat> okay. And if if you zoom in. This is a stacked photo, so it's a little bit hard to see the star trails, but there are actually star trails here in the background in this shot here, okay. because it's like 10 photos that I've put on top of each other to remove the noise. Okay. So it's probably maybe like 20 minutes, half an hour or so, I guess. And then the Northern Lights just started. So I took like, you know, probably like, one shot here and then i took maybe another shot where they moved a little bit to the left and then one more when they popped a little bit more and so forth so yeah they, they weren't standing in that particular location for for a long time all right, all right. so thank yeah. you did not take I, the you did not carry the piano with you from denmark no so that's what i was i was going to ask matt that i heard this i read the story in uh, facebook or i think instagram then there was an interesting story about this piano you know someone mentioned that it, it was it was upside up and when you know a few months ago and then when matched with the picture it just fell down <laughs> yeah so, it's uh, it, it's uh, it's apparently a, a local uh, piano artist who put it there and because this area of Iceland is technically private ground you have to pay to get into uh, to stocksness yeah, she asked yeah. if she could just leave it there and and the owner said yeah sure uh, it, it's an old um, nato station area that yeah, yeah. There, there's a lot of stuff there it, some people are like ah oh, you shouldn't leave a piano behind you personally i would say like in this particular case it, it's kind of fun that there is a piano it's it's an interesting foreground so, yeah it, 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 it's not like a, a barrel of toxic waste it's just a piano yeah so great great yeah all righty so this one here i wanted to show that and this was how it looked more or less straight out of my camera and just going to camera raw i think it just yeah I, I added quite a lot of contrast to it it was uh you can see here straight out of camera it's fairly flat photo so it just cranked up the contrast and uh yeah i added the foreground here you can see mm. and 
just to make some time blend. I wanted a little bit more like depth in the photo and, and that compression. So in this particular case, I just added that extra wave. It's probably the same wave as the one behind it, uh, just moved a bit further in. And uh, here's a great example of me adding glow to the side. You can see this layer actually looks like this. It, it is just a glow. I just use the filter render lens flare, and then I just manipulate that lens flare to my liking. Okay. Blur it and change the colors of it. Adding some auto effects, and I just like you know work on getting the contrast and the colors right all the way through the photo. It's basically the same as I just showed. But you can see here, I actually for a long time thought that my photo was finished when it looked like this. Um, but that's because I probably can't see how red it is. So I threw it into some of my photography buddies and, and they gave me some valuable feedback on it. So this is actually the final photo where I, I have removed a lot of the reds and, and popped more of the blues uh, in it. And then just, you know, cleaned it up, removed a little bit of this foam stuff here that uh, draws attention. But this is, again, like the, the color grading part is a lot of work to get that right until it's to my liking. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the final photo here. But I don't always, uh, this is the final photo, always do this much editing. If we just uh, jump into camera raw, with this photo, you can see I've hardly touched it. A little bit of negative dehaze up with the whites a little bit, just to see the def default photo here, just to give it a little bit more contrast than the photo. And the dehaze just to, yeah, make it a little bit more hazy. And then I just finished it off in Photoshop. There is like a little branch down here I removed. I did some noise reduction also use Nick Define for that. And this last layer, I think it just cleaned some star trails here in the background. Yeah, you can see there's some star trails here because this is a 30 second exposure at 200 millimeter. So the stars uh, or the, the star trails are quite, um, what do you call it? They are very apparent, very fast when you shoot at 200 millimeter. So I just removed those because they were a little bit of distraction, I think. So yeah, this is uh, this is how I I do my edits. Some of them are quite a lot, and I showed you some of the more heavy edited photos, uh, just to give you an idea about how many layers I actually put in, but also just to give you an idea that. Yeah, I just keep continuing editing on the same layer fairly non-destructively uh, until I'm satisfied with it. Mads, I do have a question again. Yeah. So uh, unlike modern photographers, and you started pretty, pretty late compared to where you have come, to be honest with you, right? Very quickly, from 2015 to where you are right now. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, just having seen your growth and progress, you know, like a lot of us in the group are late bloomers as well. We started like only a few years back trying to brace up. You are quite a rarity. You give out information so openly about tagging the location, selling your maps. Even in this tutorial, actually, I think you've gone deeper than anybody has done so far. And you know it's going to be on YouTube. I'm just being very open, right? And you're also trying to sell your tutorials online. So is this like the natural part of you, like always going, you know, out of your way to provide information to people because you were a teacher? Yeah, you, I, I think it was Nick Page who talked about like, you know, at some point when it comes to the, the Photoshop tutorials, like I have learned everything from Photoshop myself. Uh, everything I've showed you here, I've learned from Photoshop. I, I have a few other tricks up my sleeve that I have learned from some of the uh, professionals, other professionals. Uh, that I'm not going to show on, on YouTube. Um, but it, it, it's not tricks that makes a huge difference to the photos. Uh, there are uh, photo landscape photography editing uh, channels on YouTube that shows more or less everything what I'm doing anyway. Um, of course, from a business side of business perspective, there's different approaches to it. And from what I see, uh, 
either we have to all agree not to show specific uh, parts of uh, of editing or we just have to destroy it for each and every one of us and just hope that the fans of our work will actually support us it, it is what it is and 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 for me it's just natural to to share i've been an educator my more or less my entire life uh, through gymnastics but also uh, as a as a landscape no, not landscape, but uh, yeah, as a gymnast and a school teacher. Um, I never went out and actually worked as a school teacher, but to me, it's just how did you make this transition? secondhand to just teach. How did you make this transition from being a, from being a teacher to a full-time landscape photographer? Um, when I was done with my bachelor, uh, you, you need what is called a professional bachelor in Denmark to become a school teacher. Uh, I, I wasn't quite done. I failed with my education. I needed to do some more philosoph philosophy uh, for personal reasons. There was uh, I wanted to get the big answers about the universe answered. Uh, so I took a, an education in uh, educational philosophy first, and it was more philosophy than it was education. But it gave me a lot of answers when I wrote my master thesis in epistemology, uh, which is basically the theory of knowledge. So I have a pretty good idea about what is like, you know, religious beliefs and what is scientific knowledge and where and how you differentiate between what is opinion and what is fact and so forth. Uh, but I knew I didn't want to make a career within that because it's just super frustrating to try to tell people that they're wrong. So uh, it was also quite natural to go into a, into a field or a subject where everything is just highly subjective anyway. Uh, it's, it's so much easier to deal with that. Yeah, yeah, do whatever you want to do. It, it doesn't really matter. Thank you. So Mas, I have a question regarding uh, the compositions that you talk about. Yeah. Uh, there are two aspects which you stress upon, which I don't hear other people talking too much, but you've been very open and very uh, you've you've been very stress uh, stressing on this one is the use of negative space and the mm -hmm. second is balancing an image these are the yeah. two aspects i hear you talk about over and over again can you talk us through that so that uh, for the benefit of all of us again uh yeah we'll balance it's uh, when you look at a photo like this one here obviously uh, it might feel because of it's fairly dark on the left side uh, that is a little bit heavy on 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 the left side, but it it's just um, when I talk about balance, I don't mean physical weight. Uh, it's not like you have an anvil which is super heavy on one side and then you have a feather on the other side. I'm just talking talking about like visual weight. But since the light comes in and and throws uh, its its beams into the valley, like you have point of interest here and here and then you have here because of the simplicity it's fairly simple to just like put it straight in the middle and then you have a more or less balanced photo um, it's not a hard science uh, it's fairly subjective I've heard some people say that some photos are balanced that I don't feel like are balanced and other people or when I say one of my photos or argue one of my photos is balanced other people say that it's not really balanced so it's not like, you know, a hard science, but I try to distribute my visual interest around the photo without having my eyes go to like one side or the other. Like in this particular example here, you could put like, you could basically put it on a weight and it would feel as if it's not tipping to one side or the yeah. other. Um, and let's see, uh, yeah, let, let's just stick to this. Let's say that the, uh, these left rocks here weren't in this photo at all, but I kept that frame there. So there was only the rock over here on the right. Then it would feel as if the photo is, uh, is heavy on the right. So it would feel as if all the visual weight is on the right and it would start tipping a little bit to the right. Uh, and that is, unless you have some kind of counter weight, on the left side, maybe in the foreground or further in the background, it doesn't really matter where it is. But as long as you put it on a scale and if it doesn't feel as if it's tipping to one side or the other, then you have achieved something which is like close to a balance. So that's one of the reasons why I really don't like to use the rule of thirds as one of the first compositional rules that you learn because you learn to put 
like in this example here, it would be acceptable to, to put this lone rock in that upper third uh, right section, but it would be out of balance. So what, what is the point of the rule of thirds if it destroys your entire photo? It would be make more way more sense balance-wise to put it straight in the middle. It might not be a super, uh, you know, aesthetic pleasing photo because it's just like a lone rock standing in the water but nevertheless balance wise it, it would work uh, to place it in the center so uh, just taking your example if we had this one rock on the right hand side and um, and we didn't have these rocks on the left hand side mm -hmm. so what of placing a sub uh, a person here on the left hand side uh, in the foreground would something like that work yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah. Balance-wise, yes, that would make sense. Uh, then I would also talk about like the direction of that person, and and is that person looking at the rock or is he looking out of the picture and all those things. But just plain balance, yes, that would work to counter. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay. Uh, now uh, Mats, can you can you just uh, in this image only? Can you just um, uh, switch off that um, first foreground layer that you created with the wave? Yeah, let's see here. Yeah, yeah. I, ha I have to remove all all the other layers too. I think that's enough. That's enough. I, I think this is this is one another classic example of uh, um, uh, of how you look at the image and how you visualize it, and uh, because because right now if we see without having seen that let us say forget that that you saw that and, uh, and the differentiator between a, a, a decent normal okay kind of image and a masterpiece is very very minuscule and and i, I think this image totally signifies that because most of the photographers uh, will probably compose it like this and maybe some will go uh, crop it closer to this wave that we are we are seeing the first wave and what you did is totally um, you you transformed the image completely and made it a masterpiece and i think this is a huge learning for uh, for everyone who's watching this and um, and uh, these are the small things which actually uh, make an image an ordinary image or a masterpiece image I, I also want to say that in this specific example, I knew what I wanted, and I knew that there was potential in the waves yeah. to 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 go in that direction. The only one other photographer I've, I've seen uh, gets uh, something like it is uh, Albert Dross from uh, from the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah, absolutely incredible photographer. Um, but he got it before me. I had visualized it before him, but he got it before me. So I was like, oh, he got it first. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it is what it is. Um, so so conceptually, those two photos, his and, and mine, are very much alike. So yeah, it, you know what you want, and then you go for it. And, and then you have different techniques, like time blending, uh, to, uh, to, to achieve that goal. Like some photographers are very uh, much against uh, compositing and uh, time blending and so forth. Then, then it, everything is composite photography when it comes to putting photos together. And then a lot of photographers, let's call it time blending, then it's okay. Uh, because there's this big debate whether or not you're allowed to put uh, photos together. Uh, but it is compositing because you are going around what you're visually seeing on location. Personally, I don't give a rat about uh, if it's composited, time blended, um, yeah, or, or whatever you can come up with. Uh, it's it's a technique to express yourself creatively, create, create, express your own creativity. Yeah, creativity. Yeah, I think I think I think what you said is right, and and it it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I believe that personally, I believe that the debates will continue to go. Uh, continue to happen whether or uh, not that you do this if you stop doing this the debate will start on something totally different so uh, people uh, will always be there to say and people will always be there to admire and the good thing i think is that you admit it openly and and uh, that's the best part of it and and why to even hide your and your website says that you're a fine art landscape photographer 
and i think that sums it up uh, and why do you hide behind it and uh, um, and i think um, i think everybody would agree that uh, there's nothing wrong in it as far as somebody is admitting it yes it will be wrong I, if you pass it off as you create you were lucky to get it there i think it comes from the misunderstanding that uh, film photographers or analog photographers couldn't do this but if if you look and on yeah, old yeah. photos from world yeah. war 1 and so forth they are composited like crazy they are yeah. cropped like crazy they they are just as edited yeah. uh, foundationally from their raw photo from the negative as uh, as as digital photos are we just have a few more uh, tools to work with in the digital age than they had but when it comes to representing reality they were as fake what the critics would call it as as this is so it it's artistry it's yes, artist. it, it depends on the individual photographer what the individual photographer wants to do with their photos if they want to document the landscape as they saw it even they have to edit their raw files towards something which is more realistic because we rarely take a photo which is exactly as we saw it like if we shoot a sunset and we expose for the highlights then the foreground is completely dark and obviously we can see with our own eyes it's not completely dark if we look into the sunset so it's the, the camera is just a tool that collects light in the most optimal way by trying to balance the luminosity going into this little box and then it's up to us to decide in what direction we want to take the photographs right perfectly explained sir um i think i think we are already past two hours and that's been an amazing session we uh, uh, how time passed we just couldn't figure out and probably you can come out of this screen share and we can start closing it down yeah all right i wish we could go on and on looking at your image and, and yeah it's uh, yeah a really so uh, uh, uh thank you mats and there is there is one announcement to make for everyone who's watching this um we requested mats to really uh, if there is something uh, some kind of discount that he can offer um on his photoshop tutorials and he has been nice and wonderful enough to offer um, everybody a discount i'll mention that in the comments i'll pin that comment um so even if you don't understand what i'm saying right now so the discount is 40% discount on his photoshop tutorials on his website every link is going to be there in the description and in comment and the code that that you need to uh, do during checkout is i n t m p i which i will again write so don't worry about it uh, my only question to mads is that what is there any validity of this um, uh, of this uh, discount uh, valid till certain time or 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 what oh um I don't know let's say 2 weeks or whatever like when I, when I see people don't buy them I just remove it so okay okay <laughs> and, and one more question which that's means that, that everybody buys for the next 2 days and if people stop then I will stop it <laughs> okay and one more question does that discount uh, is that discount applicable on mass uh, new book because his new book is out no. yeah no no it's not it's only no. on my tutorials no, no, no. No, 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 cheap. He put it very cheap, right? No, that is as as such very cheap. I think yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah, I would love to own those books, so I'll oh, go ahead. Uh, I already have his first one, so I intend to buy the second one. Yeah. And uh, so this discount is on the Photoshop tutorials. And thank you, Mads, for being so considerate. And uh, uh, believe me, it's going to be very helpful to everyone. And so I'm going to take it for two weeks now, and I'm going to announce it for two weeks, uh, just for your understanding. And, and, and I'm yes. being open here and, and sharing everything here. And um, so I think there is, uh, yeah, people are appreciating a lot of insights and inspiration. Wonderful, thanks, Mads and team. Uh, what a great session! Thank you, Mads, and uh, it's been phenomenal session. As I said, it um, every second, every moment, uh, we enjoyed um, being with you. um i think you also in, um, i hope that you also enjoyed being on this session absolutely uh, yeah like my 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 voice is weird now <laughs> my throat <laughs> is burning but yeah yeah it was fun all right all right so, time just flew by we were, we thought of yeah. one and a half hour and now it is almost 3 hours almost to to us to us so, so i think we'll not waste much time uh, he is already looking in that direction somebody is asking <laughs> so it's, it's okay 
and uh, so bye bye thank you so much bye everyone uh, thank, thank you, you so guys on the youtube thank you every uh, all of you panelists and um, hope to stay connected that is thank more you. important and hope to do some things together maybe we'll try and bring you to india and take you to some exotic places or we'll come to uh, iceland with you let's see let's see how let's uh, the covid thing open up now yes that's more important <laughs> thank you okay. bye bye take bye. care bye Thank you. Bye.